So, good day everybody and welcome again to Cafe Revolution. As promised, we're going to make int interesting interviews on the road with uh, interesting characters. I've met many interesting characters in my life, uh, traveled to many countries, and today we have Roger Rhee. Yeah? Ria. Ria, Ria. <laughs> Roger Ria. Ria. Okay. There you go. Hello. <laughs> Roger Ria, maybe the last hippie alive. <laughs> maybe, so. <laughs> Uh, Roger has uh, traveled a lot in Asia and he's also the author of uh, quite a famous book called Hippies Never Die. We have a right here. Copy, yeah. copy of it here. So <laughs> Roger, before we talk about your book, uh, tell us about how this, you know, you must have uh, had some experiences before you could write a book. That's true, yeah. So where, where did it all start? <laughs> it all started with many of my friends kind of forcing me, pushing me into this. Oh man, you should write a book. You have so many interesting stories and so many experiences and so much travels. And, and I was like, wait a minute, you ever been to a bookshop, store? You see how many hundreds of books are there laying around? Who's yeah. going to buy my book? Okay. Yeah, but your stories are unique and they are special and why not you do it? So that stuck in my mind and I said, okay, one time, one day I will have a place and I will have the patient to sit down and start on it. Yeah. And uh, that took uh, some years until it really came to the finalization. I was in Kulu Manali, okay. North India, in Himachal in the valley during the monsoon. So it rains a lot and I said, okay, I start with the book. And the, most, the hardest thing is to start. Absolutely. You to start everything in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You sit on a blank page and you think, what am I going to do now? It's like play, painting a painting on a blank paper. Absolutely. How do you start? How do you start? You know? yeah. It took me a long time until I got that input, how to start. Okay. Well, your story, I mean, you have quite a unique story. So, uh, I mean, we've talked before. We met already, I think, last year or even two years ago, mm. we met already first mm. time. And we've talked before, and uh, I think you're one of the last overland travelers. Ah, you've did the, the journey quite a few yeah, times from Europe. Six times, six times. Can you talk nice. about this journey a bit? You know, I mean, the, it used to be a big, big story in the old hippie days in the '60s, but you did it like in the '80s or yeah, late '80s, ladies beginning and '90s, just before it really. I mean, that time Afghanistan was already a no-go okay. country okay. because the Russians will put so many mines there and then they don't give you a visa. Okay, so okay. My way was going to South Iran and going up back up okay. to Iran on the Indian border. Okay. So, but to say something about this journey. I mean, it's quite a unique journey. How long does it take? Yeah, it took about six weeks. I have to say, I also take passengers along with me, okay. which I met in Switzerland while I doing market. Okay. I had a table with some stuff I brought back from overland from all these exotic countries, and okay. people kind of put some pictures there on the table, and people say, oh, wow, is this your bus, and you go to India with that, and I say, yeah. How long it takes? I said, sorry, wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I have not a fixed schedule, but approximately six weeks. And how many, how many today. visas do you need on the way? How many visas? Uh, visas you get uh, in Eastern Europe, you get them on the border, but okay. to apply visas mainly it's uh, Iran, Pakistan and India. Okay. You apply for okay. And then the Indian visa is, is on the day, date of issue, okay. not the date of entry, so yeah. you have to take care on that. So you arrive on time? You have to arrive on time? No, we, we went to Pakistan in Islamabad on the Indian embassy and did it there. Okay. And then it's just a one hour or a one day drive to the border. Okay. To India. Okay, so tell us one interesting story from this uh, six, seven journeys you did. I mean, the rest people can read in your book, <laughs> but one interesting story from this overland journey. Okay, well, okay. there we go. Because I'm doing it several times, I'm familiar yeah. on the borders with the custom, they know me. Yeah. So I arrive to the border of Pakistan, leaving South Iran okay. with my passengers. I, as usual, I parked the bus in the custom compound. Yeah. I took a carnet passage, which is kind of a passport for your vehicle. Okay. And 
and I'm asking my passengers, my co-passengers, I said, let's go and meet Jamie the, the custom immigration we have already done. Ah, you think we have to come? I said, yeah, come man, guys, come. Okay. So I took all this paperwork with me, we lock the bus, we go in that hall, a big hall, okay. which is empty, <laughs> apart from very old tables and yeah. very cracky chairs. And, yeah. and I'm going there and I put this carnet paper down to the desk and then waiting for a guy to appear. And I say, here, yeah, clear the carnet, the entry to the bus to this country. Yeah. yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes to the bus and he comes back. He says, okay, let's go. So I told my passengers, let's go. We meet the boss, he's a huge Pakistani, like he's two okay. meters tall, okay. with dark glasses. Full of sheep inside his stomach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably yeah. big yeah. uniform, yeah. you know. And ha half part of his handcuffs hanging out his shirt. <laughs> okay. And he takes the glasses off, <laughs> yeah. and he looks at everybody in the eyes, and he says, hey, you people smoke hashish. Okay. And they went, oh, no, sir, and what's hashish? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he said, okay, then you better wait here outside on the bench. Now my good friend Roger is here. We always get stoned. <laughs> <laughs> so he took me into the office. Okay. And I said, please, a signature and a stamp. He's yes. the one who clears the car name. Okay. Rolling papers with you? I said, sure, the long ones, do you okay. like, no? And he went, yeah, yeah, skin one up. And he gave me this big lump, you know? Okay. <laughs> so I started skinning up, we have this joint, and they say, hey, what about the signature? You're stamping the paper. Yeah, make another one, make another one. I call for chai. <laughs> so he takes, picks up the phone while yeah. I'm rolling another one, yeah. and he's uh, on the phone or the chai, also for the guys outside on the bench. Yeah. So the chai comes in with a cardboard box with biscuits. Okay. When he opened that box, man, it was crawled with ants. So oh. I can't refuse, you know, it's like oh. you have to be polite with the guy. Yeah, of course, you want your the visa. Boss, yeah. yeah. So I went like, okay, took the biscuit and tap it on the table to get all the ants off and dip it in the chai and have a small prayer and then <laughs> took it in. And yeah, a few joints later again, there was, it wasn't even finished and uh, Okay, he, he gets to sign the paper, but he asked me because the, in the cornet, on the back of the cornet, they write what you bring in the country. Okay. So you're not, uh, you're not allowed to sell these things. When okay. you leave, they recheck where are these goods. Okay, okay. They're okay. still with you. Okay, yeah. you're clear. And then he's asking me, how many ashtrays you have in your bus? <laughs> and I went, like, ashtrays? He said, yeah, yeah, you know, I have to write something you bring into Pakistan. <laughs> I said, okay, I have 11 ashtrays, 11 ashtrays, a spare tire, yeah. a water tank, and that's it. Mm. That's all he marked in the thing. I mean, Iran, they mark every electronic gadget, everything you had at that okay. time with you. No, there was no phones or mobiles and of course, but okay, a yeah. camera or whatever, small camera. So I said, please, let me go now. And he said, go to Quetta, which is the next big city, 600 kilometers away, a drive fully okay. through the desert. Okay. Which is okay for me because the, in Pakistan, the lines change, right? The traffic, you go to the left side yeah, yeah, yeah. before you drive on the right okay. side. Okay. So it's a huge desert, so you get used to cross each okay. other on the other part of okay, the road, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was no road, which is the desert, right? Okay. So I, say, I said to him, yeah, we go to Quetta and why don't you stay here? I said, no, no, I will. Really, I want to be in Quetta soon. You go to Quetta, you're going to get stoned in Quetta. I said, sure, man. <laughs> and he said, and then he said, I said, sure, man, but it's not possible here. And he said, no, no, wait, wait, wait. And he's opened his drawer and he gave me a lump like this. The okay. best Afghani hashes you can imagine. Okay. Puts it on the desk and says, welcome to Pakistan, my friend. <laughs> That so probably won't happen today, no, but uh, that, that's, the, that's the good old that's, days. That's, yeah, the, that's the good old days. So me, finally, really, I gave him, of course, I gave him the papers because yeah. they don't have, they skin out the cigarettes and they put the tobacco okay. out and mix and shovel it back and that's okay. how they do it. So I opened the door, my passengers all freaking out, looking at me, totally stoned with red eyes okay. getting out there. What happened to you? And I said to them, oh, the, the negotiations were very tough. <laughs> so we yeah. finally went back into the bus and started driving out through the desert. 
And then to one of a passenger, all of a sudden, I said, why don't you want to skin one up? And he went, you got some? And I gave him, the customer, the, the, the boss? <laughs> and I said, I told you, negotiation were tough. Oh my God. <laughs> so I think we shift now from stone people to uh, meditative people. Okay. A big jump. I, you, yeah, that's a big <laughs> jump, but it seems that it was a big jump in your life too. Yeah. You know? So. Mm -hmm. uh, I see, I mean, we've talked, and you have quite a close relationship with His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama. Right. Can you tell us how, how did you meet him the first time, and how, how did you connect? Like, how I mean, many, yeah, mm. well, many people meet His Holiness, but they don't really have a journey with him. They meet, they have a mm. conversation, they maybe take kata, but that's it. But mm. for you, obviously, from the first moment you met, it became a journey. So, oh, yeah, can I mean, you tell in a short... Uh, few words, how, hmm. how did that happen? To start in the, all, all in the beginning, first, okay. Tibetan refugees came to Switzerland in 1959. Okay. Switzerland was the first country outside India uh, uh, accepting Tibetan refugees. Okay. So I kind of grew up there, my generation people. Okay. So already I go to their home, I see the altar, I see the picture of His Holiness, and I'm get like, who is this guy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's how it started. Yeah. And then more and more, I mean, even when I traveled to India with the bus, I always had a picture of His Holiness in the bus. And so one day I ended up in Dharamsala, where he lived. Yeah. Where we are now. Where yeah. we are now, right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm meeting him, meeting him for the first time. There was, it was through a common monk friend, okay. who was very close to him, who escaped Tibet. He had to escape, and His Holiness sent him to Switzerland. And I met him in Switzerland, and he was kind of the door opener so to speak, okay. to His Holiness. So when I met him first, we had this, uh, it was amazing. It was like we had an eye contact and it felt like sparks flying around us. That, that strong it was. Yeah. Know. And from then the connection from then the connection. From I mean, uh, I'd just like to show, like in the book, uh, here's uh, Roger with His Holiness. A picture taken in high, inside his residence. Okay. Like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, another thing I found fascinating uh, about you, uh, maybe you can speak to our audience, is that you tell me you haven't had an address for 20 years, or 25. More than, more than 20 years. I left Switzerland back in 1981. Yeah. Switzerland, they had this rule, it's a small country, it's very easy to control the population of 6 million, that okay. time 5 million. Okay. Switzerland has an army system for every man, every male with the age of 20 joins the army, if you want or you don't want. Okay, so, so you didn't join, you didn't join. I had to. Okay, you, I you, had no you, you excuses, had to. Okay. I was fit, body, physically oh, yeah, okay. fit, okay. cripples they don't take. Okay, but at least you don't fight wars, you just join the army for some civil defense. service. We are a defense of okay. country, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So anyway, I said to the guy, I went there, I said, listen, if I have to come here, I want to have a profit. What do you mean a profit? There's nothing to profit here. Yeah, yeah. I said, I want to become a truck driver. So already in my mind, I got a free ah, license okay, for later with the bus, no? ah, and I get to know about the engine and how maintain things in the car, and, and so that's what they made me become a truck driver, which is like one hour a week you drive a truck, and the rest you go and shoot with the gun and do okay. the same shit like okay. everybody else. Okay. <laughs> but what, what so, I want to know is about the address story. Like, yeah, so yeah, let me yeah. get to the point. That yeah. was uh, in Switzerland. If you want to leave the country. For more than six months, you need a permission from the army, not from the government, huh? from the army. Okay. And they want to know exactly where is your whereabouts. So you're obliged to go every month to the nearest embassy or consulate of Switzerland and tell them, hello, here I am. That's the first of hello. Yeah, is, uh, that is all in the book, my friend. Okay. Yeah, all okay. there. Okay. So I say, fuck you, I don't okay. need a permission. I'm a free soul, I leave. Okay. That's what I did. I left in 1981. Yeah. It took me to Jamaica, all the way to Jamaica. I got an alignment over there by smoking a big Charlie me back to okay. smoke. Okay. But this is how it happened. Then yeah. I realized the least I need in life is a mailbox. As soon as you have a mailbox, they put all kind of shit in there. Pay okay. this, do that, have insurance, da 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 da. So I'm living since 1981 without a mailbox. Okay. That's how it happened. So I travel and. So living without a mailbox and living without contacts, if people want to get your book, how do they get your book? They can order it through my website. I have a website yeah. and I have a, a 
payment facility okay. also there. Okay. So, so you are evolving it. somewhere in the world. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work without money at all, so you have to make a big effort. Cool. So uh, I will leave uh, Roger's uh, website and Facebook uh, link underneath this uh, article. If you want to read his book, I mean, you can see it's, uh, it's the only way at the moment to order a paper bag. I would have been having discussions with Roger. Maybe one day he'll have an e-book. <laughs> but uh, in the Let's meantime, see the future. in the future. But in the meantime, uh, hippies never die is uh, is only available on paperback. And fair enough, because reading a book on a paperback is much nicer than uh, than on a screen. So and to tell you about reading, you also got forty-seven color pictures involved in a book. Yeah, and I can tell you after <laughs> looking at the pictures, they're quite interesting pictures. So. You can order from the website, he'll send it to you, all links are above. So if you like this, subscribe and like, and uh, yeah, have a look at Roger's page. Also subscribe and like to his page, and uh, yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah, thanks for joining.